Hello everyone and welcome to your lecture number 10 for Earth Science. This is your professor Dr. Hurt and we're going to be talking about mass wasting today and soils. So this is actually kind of a cool picture. This is from when I was uh, doing Peace Corps in Africa and uh, what you're seeing here is kind of an ex uh, example of mass wasting. So I was in a village uh, there in Malawi in Southeast Africa and this used to be a bridge, and it, it was very funny. Uh, well, I mean, it, it was tragic in a way, but uh, it was kind of funny because I actually took a group of farmers uh, to teach them about soil erosion and mass wasting uh, right the day before this bridge collapsed. And, and I was using the bridge to show how this ravine, uh, you know, this, there's a small river down here, and it had cut away so much at the banks that uh, this bridge had ultimately collapsed. So... Uh, it was really it was really crummy because it's one of the nicest bridges in town. But um, anyway, that's what happens though. That's called mass wasting and soil erosion. That's what we're talking about today. So um, first of all, mass wasting. That's a weird word. Probably haven't heard that term before. Um, what is mass wasting? Well, it's right there. What you're looking at. Um, probably it's kind of colloquially you might know it as a, a landslide or something like that but it's really just the downhill movement of rock sediment and soil under the force of gravity so that's all it really is it is in a way just an a, an erosion process so sediment soil rock is being transported now in the last lecture you know in sediment and weathering you learned how stuff gets eroded and, and moved by ice and wind and water and stuff like that but in this case it's just gravity that's moving the material so uh, that any process that moves sand and sediment and rocks and soil etc we call that mass wasting so what force drives mass wasting it's gravity right um, <clears throat> so uh, gravity is kind of linked to this idea of angle of repose and I kind of had a little mini lecture on this so if you listen to that mini lecture from last week that's okay um, you can kind of skip this part but uh, angle of repose is the idea that when you lay sediment um, you know it can only you know you start to lay down in a pile like this and it's being deposited it can only get at such a steep angle and once that angle is kind of uh, exceeded then it's going to start to collapse so the soil the sediment whatever else is going to start to collapse so that's that's angle of repose so that's how mass wasting in a way happens is the the angle of the sediment you know whatever angle that is if it's you know 45 degrees or 30 degrees or whatever uh, it collapses uh, due to uh, that the angle of uh, angle of repose so um, there's a cinder cone showing this again this angle of repose of the sediment so if that angle grows too much you can have collapse and mass wasting so there's a lot of different mass wasting processes so you know in your uh, lecture assignments I ask about different different types um, some of them are very fast some of them are very slow some of them also happen under wet conditions here and some of them happen under dry conditions okay so uh, these are all just, you know, just kind of, th these are a whole bunch of kind of like different mass wasting processes that are organized on the basis of wet and wet versus dry and slow versus fast. So some slow ones would include like soil creep and slump. And uh, by the way, this, this happens, a lot of these things will happen after a big rain um, in Corpus. So uh, you, you might even notice uh, some of these things happening if you keep your eyes peeled around town. So um some faster things are like rock fall and debris flows mud flows those are kind of the scary things that can be actually pretty dangerous right so rock falls are things that are fast and dry so rock falls are fast and dry uh, and this is when the force of gravity just drops rock debris uh, off steep cliffs and rock walls so it's often coming to rest in a talus slope talus slope is just um, some of you if you ever like to hike or anything like that you might know at the base of a mountain there's often a lot of gravel and large chunks boulders and things of rocks that are broken off of the broken off of the mountain or the cliff face so that that aggregates together in a in a uh, what's called a talus slope okay so rock falls can build up these talus slopes so there's some like very terrifying videos you can find online of Wow, my gosh, that must have shook the ground so hard when you witness that. How terrifying is that? So that's what a rock fall looks like. 
Uh, another one. Uh, this is something now. I come from California, of course, so this is a big deal there. Um, not such a big deal here in South Texas, just because we don't have as much topography. You know, we don't we don't have a lot of hills and stuff like this, so we don't see it as much. Um, especially in Corpus, you know, it's so flat. The topography is so flat, we don't see this as much. But uh, debris flows are when uh, now. Kind of in like normal vernacular, everyday language, we, we probably call this a landslide. Uh, that's not really a scientific term, so it's called debris flow. So debris flow consists of wet mud, boulders, trees, etc., flowing down slopes, usually after a heavy rainfall. A very famous one that actually happened in California when I was there was the La Conchita. And um, it killed it killed quite a few people. I forget if I... Oh, I don't even have the video. Um, yeah, I think I got rid of that video. But uh, that was a very terrifying one, and it, I think it I think it was caught on tape actually, so you can look it up. I used to have a link to it. I'm a little surprised. It's okay. So um, you know, after a rainfall, you can imagine that all of the sediment is uh, you know resting on each other. So every little piece of sediment is kind of resting there, and uh, after a heavy rainfall, it can fill up all the pore spaces with water. And the hydraulic pressure of the water actually separates the grains. Now, once the grains separate like that, you see how the grains actually like aren't touching each other anymore? Like it's it's all filled up with water. Once the grains stop touching each other, they lose something called their shear strength. And the material has no shear strength. This causes the hillside to give way. And uh, it, it causes the loss of internal strength that, you know, right, you know, that, that, causes the debris flow right so um, you can kind of see this happen if you ever made a, a sand castle before right um, dry sand is going to accumulate in a you know typical kind of angle of repose type pile um, but if you put a little bit of water that water kind of helps with cohesion and you can actually make like a sand castle right so if it's a little bit damp uh, however if you have too much water what happens to your sand castle Right, it just collapsed into like a wet puddle, right? Wet sandy puddle. So the reason is that you have too much hydraulic pressure. The grains are no longer see how the grains are no longer touching each other. The actual sand grains are no longer touching. It loses its internal strength and it gives way and it collapses. Okay, so that's what happens usually after a rainfall causes debris flows. Okay, um, so moving along, a debris slide. It's a little bit similar. Um, so it's a type of landslide where you have a mixed mass of rock, regolith, we're going to talk about what regolith is a little bit later, and soil that move quickly downhill on a cushion of air. Hmm, what is a cushion of air? Sounds like a nice thing to sit on, right? But actually a cushion of air is when, what happens when you have a, dis, a, a, a landslide that's happening so fast. So um, I can kind of show it to you here. Um, it's happening so fast that the air beneath of it doesn't have a chance to escape. So the material that's sliding downhill is actually not even touching the, the ground anymore. It's sliding over the surface on a, on a cushion of air. Um, if any of you ever heard of hydroplaning, okay, it's a similar thing. You know, and hydroplaning is when you lose control of your car on a really wet day. And what happens there is your tires literally lose contact with the ground, right? So your your car is sliding on a cushion of water, okay? And, and you know, and you lose traction and you, you know, you can end up crashing or you lose control, right? So hydroplaning, I'm sure you, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that. Um, if you haven't, it's, uh, it's a dangerous thing you have to be careful for. So, um... Anyway, that's that's what happens in a way with with debris slides. So they happen very fast, and they can be very devastating. They are usually caused by a slope failure along a flat plane, roughly parallel to the to the slope detachment. So this happens a lot in. Um, you remember in sedimentary rocks, we had uh, sedimentary rocks forming in beds, right? So when the bedding planes are parallel to the slopes, like you see here, you see how the bedding planes of this rock are par it's parallel to the slope. It's a very dangerous situation because it's very easy for whole sections of that mountain to cleave off, break off along those bedding planes and slide downhill. Okay, so it makes it very easy for large sections of rock to detach and slide downward. Okay, and that's called a debris slide. This was actually, this is pretty cool. Uh, this is um, 1959, there was the Madison slide, which was one of the biggest landslides 
ever occurred in kind of human history, actually. And it's pretty cool because it actually um, it actually clogged up this river. I can't remember the name of the river now. It's escaping me. And it created a lake. And so it dammed up this river and created a lake. And there was no lake there before. So uh, uh, they actually call this lake. You want to know the name of the, quake, of, of the lake? It's called Quake Lake. Isn't that a good name for it? Quake Lake. And it's called Quake Lake because it was naturally created in 1959 by this by this uh, Madison slide and earthquake. So um, it's kind of cool. Uh, there we go. I already talked about that. So now a slow process that happens is something called slumping. So slumping is when a large area of ground slides downhill intact. Um, it's a little bit faster than soil creep, which I'll co cover there in a minute. Um, but again, it happens during kind of like wet, usually kind of wet conditions. Um, I often will see this. Um, around town, uh, especially like in along the banks of Oso Creek, I will see this happen um, after like a large rainfall. So like hunks of the bank of Oso Creek will fall into into the creek and uh, it, it'll slump into the creek. So uh, next one, another slow process. It's kind of cool. It's called soil creep. Now this one, we don't get this too much here in Corpus, but in places where there is a a lot of freezing and thawing. Um, so, you know, when water freezes, it expands, right? We've already talked about that several times in this class. So it, it expands and the frost, as it expands, kind of pushes the rocks apart, right? Pushes the soils apart. And then when it melts, um, it kind of contracts again. So you have this constant contraction and expansion, contraction and expansion. The surface expands right? It contracts, it expands, it cont contracts. And what happens is soils will slowly kind of loosen and start to creep downhill. And I don't know if any of you, now again, this is not something we'll see very much in Corpus, but maybe some of you have seen something like this, where a tree is kind of like growing, kind of like to the, almost kind of straight out, and then it turns. You see how the trunk of that turns? That, so maybe if you've seen that before, um, that happens on steep hillsides where there's soil creep. So what's happening is that tree kind of fell over and then it righted itself up. And then it kind of will start to fall over again and it'll right itself up. So it gets a curved um, trunk like that. Um, another things are called lahars. Okay, um, lahars. So lahars are a little bit uh, different than debris flows. So de lahars, the reason that lahars are special is because they are volcanic mud flows. So they're made up of volcanic mud. And you can see the video right here. It's very terrifying. Um, these are actually extremely dangerous. These actually killed more people in the Mount St. Helens eruption um, than, than the eruption itself. So lahars, in 1980, when we had Mount St. Helens, um, it's the largest eruption in um, you know U.S. history, uh, I mean, on the contiguous, I mean, of course, Hawaii has a lot of eruptions, right? But in the contiguous 48 states is the largest. So the Lahar has actually killed more people at Mount St. Helens than the volcanic eruption itself. So this is when all of the snow melt and a big rain came and it mobilized all that volcanic ash and was actually able to wipe out large sections of the city. So um, that's, that's, uh, or actually those are, Lahar. So that's just kind of a quick breeze through some um, mass wasting, uh, mass wasting processes. Okay. So wow, this is kind of a short lecture today. I guess you, you probably won't mind. But um, let's talk a little bit now. Move on to soils. So we're kind of getting to the back page here. Um, soils are composed. Of, so you know, one question you might have is uh, maybe, maybe you don't, but. Uh, one question you might have is, how is soil different than just like sediment? So soil is different because soil contains sediment. That's the mineral content there, about 45%. Um, but it also contains other stuff. So it often contains a lot of air, often contains a lot of water. And another most important thing that makes it different than just plain sediment is it contains this 5% OM. The OM stands for organic matter. So that organic matter is so important. So when you look at soil, soils usually have something called horizons in them. And the O horizon is the first horizon up here. You can see the kind of different layers of the soil here. The O horizon here is the one that contains that organic matter. And that's what makes it so rich and fertile. And that's what the trees usually uh, 
plunge their roots into because they want to get that organic matter that has lots of the nutrients, okay? So you know how important soils are for the planet, right? So planet is, so all your plants depend on the soils for their root systems and, uh, and of course, the, the animals and all the biologic uh, activity depend on those plants. So um, we're going to talk a little bit here now about how plants interact with the soils. So uh, another term here is regolith. Regolith. So regolith is basically just soil without the organic matter. So it's just the mix of broken down rocks and minerals. So example, talus piles, loose sand, gravel. So regolith is kind of like sediment. Maybe you can even think of it as exactly the same as sediment. Okay. So the regolith, rego means blanket. Lift means stone, so it's kind of the stony blanket that covers much of Earth's surface. Now, when you start to mix that with organic matter, then we call it a soil. Okay, so um, let me see. Uh, talk a little bit here about soil texture. I don't know if any of you like to garden. I, I'm always kind of surprised. I always ask this in my class, and I say, "Does anybody like to garden?" And very few people raise their hands. I'm a little bit surprised, but. I guess not too many, it's not too popular of a hobby, but I like to garden. And one thing that we gardeners always think about, uh, think of is soil texture. So what is soil texture? Soil texture is the distribution of different sizes of particles in your soil. Okay, so um, they, we, we kind of divide soil into three different textures. Okay, those are kind of different sizes of particles. You can have the smallest one is called clay. Okay, and I think you all know clay. Have you ever seen this happen in corpus in the soils? It gets all cracked like that. That happens because we have a lot of clay soil here. And this clay, you might remember from the sediment lecture, is very, 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 very fine-grained material. Very fine, almost ashy sort of material. Um, they have very little pore space, and that means that very little water can, can penetrate it and, and permeate through it. That's a big deal because if water can't penetrate it and permeate through it, it means that um, the water is going to kind of stand. And you'll see this happen a lot in corpus. You know, um, we have a lot of standing water issues and drainage issues because water can't penetrate through our clay soils. Okay, it results in poor drainage. So uh, poor drainage—it's the problem for. Uh, for a lot of gardeners because the plant roots can rot and other things. So heavy clay soils like we have here in Corpus, not the best. Now another type is called sand. And of course, uh, I think you all know what sand is. Sand is nice in that it has good drainage. However, so water can flow right through sand, can permeate through sand very easily. However, uh, it's very the, the particles are so large, it's very difficult for plants to extract nutrients from it, right? The more uh, surface area you have on the particles, the more nutrients can be extracted. And clay, the smaller the particle, um, the smaller the particle, the more surface area to volume ratio. And so it's easier. So for example, with clay soils, it's easier to extract nutrients out of it for plant roots. However, for sand, it's it's more difficult, but the drainage is better. So you think I think that you're kind of seeing um, getting to the kind of Goldilocks guy. So the kind of the Goldilocks zone. You know, you know, clay is clay is too fine, sand is too coarse, but silt is just right. So silt is something that is kind of like the per, good garden soil is usually pretty silty. So um, we, we kind of split up these different textures into what's called a ternary diagram, kind of a triangle diagram like this. So in each corner, you see silt, clay, and sand. Okay, so each corner is like the end member, and there's mixtures, some proportion of mixture in between. So the best mixture is right here called loam. And you can see that loam is about 50% silt, 50% sand, and a little bit of clay. You see how we're pretty far from the clay clay point here. So it's, it's kind of a mix of silt and sand and a little clay. Okay. So anyway, that's soil texture. That's why it's important. Uh, soil properties, because it's going to be so important for, for plant roots, right? If you don't have the right soil texture, you could have, for example, your, your soils are too clay, clay -y, you're going to have drainage issues and your plant roots can rot. If you have too sandy a soil, the plant's um, can't extract as many nutrients. Okay, so you kind of have to have a nice mixture of, of everything. So plant roots need to be able to 
um, get in get their get you know get their roots and in, in between the soil particles they need to be able to get the blue stuff which is the water right you see the water and you know what the the white stuff represents actually represents air it might surprise you but your plants your plant roots need air too to survive so there needs to be an, enough pore space for you know in between the particles there needs to be enough space in between these particles for plant roots to extract moisture and air and nutrients okay so we're always looking for pore space um, in our soils to make the soils good for plants in agriculture you might know we always till the ground right you have to till the ground and, and break it up why because you want to increase that beautiful pore space right so loam is the best way to support plant life that's the best kind of soil for plant life all right, let's talk about five factors that come into play with soil formation. So um, the five things that affect soil formation. Soils can form very slowly. Sometimes topsoil only forms about, um, you know, like an inch a century. I know that sounds extreme, but it but in some places it's like that. Some places can form topsoil a little bit faster, maybe in, maybe um you know, an inch every decade or so, but it, it, it forms slowly. And so that's why you might hear of people trying to conserve topsoil. And it's because topsoil is a very important nutrient. Remember, that's that O horizon material, has all the organic matter, has all the nutrients. So it's an important factor in agriculture. So uh, first thing that is important for soil formation is the parent material. That means what has made the sediment you know what rocks have broken down what minerals have broken down how much organic matter is in it blah 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 blah. so that's so that's an important factor so what bedrock is uh the sediment built upon right that's an important an important thing to consider uh the climate can affect soil formation if it's hot if it's cold if it's dry if it's humid um, all those things affect rates of weathering uh, rates of chemical weathering you know, the the rate at which iron is going to break down into iron oxide, the rate at which feldspar is going to break down and create clays, all that stuff that hopefully you remember from our last lecture on weathering, right? Um, the plants and animals make a big difference because those are going to be the contribution, how you get contributions to organic matter. And organic matter is so important for plants, okay? If you want to improve a soil, the best way to improve it and make it more fertile is adding well-rotted organic matter, well-decomposed organic matter. That is called humus. That's another, another term for that is humus, okay? Which is really just another word for soil or, or and, uh, you know, earth, you know? And by the way, it's also the root word for humility too, right? Humility, you're like, you're like the soil, you're like the dirt, you're like the earth, right? So you're, you're grounded and down to earth. Uh, so anyway, humus, is the term for that contribution of, of organic matter in the soil. Uh, another thing is topography, okay? Not much soil can accumulate on hillsides. So that's why if, if you drive around and go to a place that is mountainous, you'll notice that the farmers aren't growing crops on hillsides. Why? Because the material, the topsoil is getting eroded. It's getting washed away by the rain and it's being brought downhill and coming to rest in the valley below. So you get great soils down here in the valleys, but you get poor soils here on the hillsides, okay? And then also, you just need time. Uh, it takes time for soil to build up. It just takes time. And like I said, sometimes it's building up at like an inch per decade, an inch per century, sometimes an inch per thousand years. So it can really take a lot of time to build up topsoil, it's precious. Um, these are different soil types that we have here. Um, that uh, in, in you know all over the all over the country, uh, the three most common here are the uh, aridosols, the molosols, and the um, ultisols. So we, however, don't have these here in Corpus. We have this kind of yellowish, light greenish stuff. That's the um, uh, the uh, alifosols. So. Those are kind of moderately leached soils that occur a lot under heavy vegetated areas like the plains and the forests and things like that. So um, that's what we have here. Um, soil erosion. Uh, just gonna gonna kind of end here. I, I went through this pretty quickly, but just gonna end here. On this is another picture from Malawi, showing the dangers of soil erosion. 
and uh, those things I'm sure they happen here too so um, I, I showed you this too right and I opened up with that these pictures from Malawi from Africa um, where the the bridge was taken out here you can see the road taken out and uh, you know if you don't if you don't do your homework properly uh, you know you can end up with soil erosion issues so uh, soil erosion uh, starts with just you know drop by drop um, uh, one raindrop can break up the soils eventually it flows into sheets and then rills then gullies are these kind of small channels that are built and it eventually leads to streams it builds up and builds up and builds up and it can become highly erosive right so these are more pictures from Africa just showing all the uh, all the effects of erosion so you can see these are crops here these are corn crops that they had planted and you can see these um, large streams that are forming and eroding away and destroying their crops right so it's so it's a big it's a big issue here is these are good pictures of rills okay and those rills are going to gather together into a stream right and you can see how erosive it is and how damaging it is to their agriculture right and, um, so soil erosion uh, human activity I guess I <laughs> I guess I have this this is supposed to be uh, something that um, you're supposed to look up in your book but I guess I actually I forgot that and uh, here I'm covering it right now but it's okay so uh, some things that aggravate soil erosion are uh, deforestation so logging and removing a trees that uh, trees actually protect the soils so I had one question that was saying um, how do plants promote mechanical and chemical weathering but they inhibit erosion well the 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 roots of plants are very effective in holding together soils okay so plants are very good and also the leaves of plants protect the soil from raindrops okay you know, raindrops break help to break up soil pretty effectively actually so plants have a few process processes the roots and the leaves protecting the soils holding the soils together with the roots that protects and and uh, inhibits soil erosion but uh, what's kind of ironic is that plants are also very good at weathering material right so we learned in the weathering lecture last time about how plant roots there's things called root wedging there's also organic acids that are emitted by plants that can weather and erode material um, however they are very good at preventing erosion so um, one of the one of the main human activities that can uh, contribute to erosion is just deforestation and, and removal of vegetation okay farming again when we farm we remove the native vegetation we remove the native trees and that leaves uh, vast areas of soil unprotected and exposed to erosion so you can see that here that again these are more pictures from Malawi from from Africa when I did my Peace Corps service and you can see this stream because they've removed uh, a lot of the native vegetation on this hillside and you can see this was actually they're doing farming on a hillside which is not not the greatest idea uh, you can see that all that removed vegetation is contributing to the soil erosion and the banks of this river keep moving this way they keep they keep widening and they keep cutting into the soils because there's no roots to hold it together there's no tree roots to hold it together so some ways that you can mitigate um, and control soil erosion is by uh, making your rows uh, contour to the topography so it, I think you can all see this this was a good example or kind of good example from Malawi showing contour rows so you can notice that they have these rows here so you'll notice that the rows are kind of going along the hillside they're going along the contours of the hillside so you don't want to make your rows going like this right going downhill because that's going to uh, that's going to contribute to the water gaining speed when you have the when you have these um, contours and these rows going kind of along the hillside it stops the water and uh, stops it from gaining speed and becoming you know a, a river right so another thing you can do are what's called cover crops uh, cover crops are when so you can see all this grass and a lot of people might look at this stuff and think oh these are like weeds or something they're not actually weeds they're cover crops so they plant these uh, maybe before they planted the corn here and it, it lived and it died and it just protects it's kind of like a blanket over the soil and it protects that soil from being eroded during the um, during the fallow season so you know um, actually I just I just saw this I was driving around and I saw how the farmers here in Corpus 
they had harvested their crops here and then the the soil was left totally unprotected during heavy rainfall and it, it leads to a lot of erosion right so um, and you don't want that erosion because that's that's removing what the erosion does is, is, is it removes the topsoil so that's very bad so they'll plant these cover crops to kind of help protect the topsoil so that you never have exposed soil that's what you want to avoid is you never want to have exposed soil this is kind of a cool picture huh so these are wind breaks so these wind breaks um, help in, in like windy areas like corpus helps protect loss of topsoil from from the wind okay so just just kind of helps to slow down the wind so that's all I have for you today. Didn't take too long to get through that. Um, I wish you a good week. I don't have any other announcements to say. So uh, keep up the good work. And I will talk to you next time. And we'll do um, streams next time.